Immediately following worship, stay tuned for Talk Back with Andrea live. For 15 to 20 minutes after online worship, everyone will have the opportunity to express their thoughts, questions, and or concerns about the subject matter of the morning. This will provide you with an opportunity to connect and gain a deeper understanding of the topics of the day. Just enter your question into the chat room or text your question to 704-343-8955. Questions read during TalkBack will be anonymous. I feel very tall and empowered right now, Stan. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> Brad Rano yep. is with us, and you have been sending in questions, so send in some in the next uh, 10 minutes. So, Brad, how about it? All right, so our first question is, what do you do when stopped by a police officer? Not just a black person, but everyone. That's a great question. I think it's a very good question. The first thing to do is uh, have a cooperative attitude with the uh, police officer. When they pull you over, they're pulling you over for a reason, obviously. So the first thing to do is, like I say, have that cooperative attitude ready for the uh, police officer upon, upon their approach. Hands on the steering wheel is what we always ask for. That's why I like to see when I, I approach a uh, vehicle. And then give me an opportunity to talk and explain the reason why I made the stop. And hopefully the stop goes really well based on the uh, attitude of uh, each party involved, the law enforcement officer, as well as the uh, person that was stopped. Okay. All right. Um, next question is, speak about reforming the thin blue line, maybe offering specifics on how we can help our black and brown loved ones not fear for their lives would be helpful to our listeners. All right. First, I want to ask, um, what is the thin blue line? Let's just bring clarity to that. Uh, thin blue line is like a brotherhood for law enforcement in support of a uh, Law enforcement blue actually represents law enforcement uh, with the uh, black background. So that's basically what it is, is the uh, support of uh, law enforcement uh, nationwide, North Carolina, state by state, however you want to uh, determine it. Okay, and so the question is what? How do we do, how do the specifics on how to reform that, you know, um, to help the black and brown loved ones not fear for their lives? Kind of like what you were talking about earlier about, you know, not defunding the police office, but maybe more training. Right. The training is, is really good. And again, within that training environment, we've got to get police officers alike talking to each other because you've got different cultures within law enforcement. If the cultures are talking and they have a better understanding of culture, even in the uh, BLET when they first start, you've got cultural differences that... Uh, Someone may be enlightened by the, uh, come mm -hmm. to understand different things. So within the law enforcement agencies, if they're having these conversations, and again, they're difficult conversations, but you have to have them. Start working from within and then work out into the community because you're going to have a better understanding of the community. So understanding is so much of a key element to get us to move forward here if we have these conversations. I think that's going to assist us and reform any type of training that we do in the future. So do you talk about the fear that African Americans feel towards police in the training? I do, and that's uh, in the initial training because there is a fear there. Even when I was pulled over as a police officer, not in uniform or anything, just the vehicle I was in, you know, there was a level of anxiety because I didn't know how it would go. Even though I'm a police officer, I'm still an uh, African American dealing with you know, the unknown as to who the uh, police officer is, their attitude towards, you know, people or, or people of uh, different races or cultures. So um, I think it's just one of those things where people are naturally going to be suspicious of the unknown. And mm -hmm. that's both sides, law enforcement or, you know, the uh, community that they're working with. We've got to get past those suspicions, for one thing, and try to move past that and do what we typically would do, just like you and I are having a conversation. There's no suspicions between us at this point, and I think it should be the same way in law enforcement, regardless of if you're wearing a uniform, I'm wearing the uniform. Yeah, fear of the unknown, yeah. And I think uh, conversations around yes. the fear that African Americans have towards police and, and being pulled. Yeah. All right, and we have another question, and this is a good one, I think. Why do you think someone would want to become a police officer today, in your opinion? They are so unappreciated. Mm. I think you still have those people out there that are, are people-oriented. They like to do things for people, the community, 
they uh, just have it so deeply embedded into their character that they feel good about doing that. So they're going to go past those walls that have been put up, those hindrances and stuff, move forward and get into law enforcement so they can get out there and have their opportunity to show, you know, what law enforcement is all about and what type of law enforcement officer they can be. So when you hear them come in day one and they have to do their initial introduction, they tell why they got into law enforcement and how they prepared for it. We uh, get a lot of information from that. And nine out of ten times, it's always going to be that they want to make a difference in the community because they are uh, a, a people first. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this kind of follows that same. Hold on, can I say yeah. one thing? Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things that struck me that day is everybody had to go around the room and, and sort of say that to the panel judges or whatever right. we were called, interviewers. And uh, you all asked them, so how are you going to give back to the right. community above and beyond your job? And you made them name very concrete steps yes. they were going to take to be actively involved in paying uh, respect and building community beyond their nine to five or whatever the hours are right. job. Um, and you held them accountable to that. Like they had to have a plan right. before they graduated of how they were going to volunteer and be of service. And, and that was impressive. Yeah, they've done that. They do that throughout. We make them do community service projects. And it starts out as one of those things where it's mandated by me, mm -hmm. but then they buy into it, and it's their project, and they love it, whether it's, uh, you know, battered women's shelter to community events or churches, going in and having conversations, schools doing presentations, just so many things that they, you can see their character start to develop around and being a part of the community. That's cool. Well, and, and the next question uh, that came in from the chat um, that was text in, uh, is there a mental evaluation for the cadets? Because you did question. talk about assessment and you talked about evaluation. Do they actually go through like a mental evaluation to make sure their psyche is? is Not coming out? into the academy. The only thing they have to do is they have to pass a physical, um, not assessment, but a, they have to take a phys medical, mm -hmm. physical. The only time that they are exposed to the uh, mental evaluation or assessment and stuff is when they are sworn in with an agency. That's an absolute. So anybody that doesn't know that. It's an absolute, and it's a uh, test that really gets to the center thing. It's probably 600 questions that they ha have to answer to a psychologist, and then mm -hmm. there's some okay. other tests behind that. And that so. is an absolute. Every yes, agency is. requires yes. that. Good. Good. All right, and I think the last one's going to take up some time. Are you familiar with the Camden Yard precinct where officers were, were assessed and then some terminated and police power reduced? If so, what do you think about that? And is that something you think that should happen in more precincts where there's problems? Has that happened yeah, since George familiar. Floyd? Not sure. They just that was a question that one of our viewers asked. So a viewer, if you're still watching and you're near your <laughs> keyboard, um, can you give us just a few more details? Uh, read the question again. Yep. Uh, are you familiar with the Camden Yard, New Jersey precinct where officers were assessed and some terminated and police union power was reduced? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not right offhand for me okay. with that. I don't think I've uh, really well, heard of it. Well, not knowing about it, but since I'm chatty and talk a lot. So I do think one of the questions could be, okay, so here we are. We know there's a problem. Right. We know there's racial prejudice and officers that have vendettas uh, and power plays. What happens and what can happen, like I'm assuming and totally don't know, but uh, that the Camden Yards thing happened uh, after, um, where is that, Don? Oh, that's just, that's another question. Oh, okay. Um, like, so what do you do to fix it right now? Like, what do we do if, could police precincts or whatever they're called go in and do an assessment of across the board of their law enforcement and fire people? Can you get fired as a police officer? Is it easy to get fired? I'm not going to say it's easy to get fired. They have to make sure that there is a fair process to the uh, officer. But based on complaints that come in, complaints are reviewed, officers' uh, actions are reviewed, and sometimes that may lead to... Uh, termination. As far as an assessment that they do within, I can't speak on behalf of a 
police agency, certainly the one that I work for, I feel comfortable that we don't really need one because I, I know the officers really well. But I think in some sense, it may be a valuable tool to go back and assess the character of your officers over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Look at uh, uh, incidents that may have taken place, positive or negative, because there are positive comments. Don't get right to think that it's all negative comments on uh, police officers. Sometimes people write in very positive uh, comments and use that maybe as an uh, uh, assessment tool. But I wouldn't say that it's a bad idea to try to implement something like that. I think you just have to be careful in the way you implement it. And okay. if it will lead to termination of officers, is it a fair process? Fair, yeah, okay. And we got time for one more? Sure. Yeah. All right, you mentioned that there is a general aversion to training by the LEOs. Should retraining, perhaps recertification, particularly IPC and bias be increased and required? Honestly, I think so. And because it's starting to, to, to lag or there's a lack of it. I think as you get into law enforcement, you get comfortable. Some of the stuff that you were taught in the academy kind of goes away or it's, it's uh, influenced to go in a different direction for whatever reasons. I think it needs to be reinforced. I think it needs to be reinforced constantly. We have annual training. There's such a thing as in-service training for all law enforcement. 24 hours of training, I think that's going to have to be increased. And I think this is going to have to be incorporated into that mandated training. And hopefully, like I say, it's well received from the uh, law enforcement mm -hmm. officers straight across the state and hopefully across the United States. I agree. Well, thank you. Well, thank you guys for your questions. And stay tuned for AMPT. And uh, have a great week. All right. So we have one more question um, for Officer Stan. Um, can you speak on how police reforming can decriminalize addiction, homelessness, and mental health so that rather than focusing on punishing the problem, we focus on helping people to fix the problem? Certainly, and we've had conversations in the past about this with several different uh, police chiefs from several different agencies. And we know that there's a problem out there, a problem that I wasn't aware of is uh, how many uh, mental cases that they deal with weekly in law enforcement. You know, some had three to five, per week, some had, you know, somewhere in the upward amount of uh, 10 to 12 per month. That's a lot. And we know that they, we're going to have to work on that from a law enforcement perspective, dealing with uh, mental health issues, the homeless, you know, people that uh, become depressed because of their situ situation, suicidal, there's such thing as suicide by cop, and that's becoming way too common for us in law enforcement. So we're taking a look at these things and how we can be um, more forward thinking with them and make an impact on uh, decreasing the numbers or getting help from the uh, law enforcement perspective. 